on this computer. And we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Reen and Susan. I'm Executive Director of the Berrien County Historical Association. And we are super excited to kick off the first of our four-part American Justice series. Uh, the series looks at the role law has played in social justice movements in the US. But in order to understand why our law has played the kind of roles it has, we need to know where it began. So we're pretty excited to have Dr. Sally Hayden from Western Michigan University joining us today. In addition to her background in history, she also has a law degree. So she's gonna be pretty expert on exactly what it is that makes everything uh, work within the law frame that we have. Um, just a few announcements before we begin. Uh, just as a reminder, we do have up until next Sunday, our historic rituals, a, the um, Freemasons of Berrien County exhibit. And then after that, we will then bring in our, and the winner is the Blossom Time Queens um, exhibit. We are still accepting donations and loans of items for that exhibit. If you are interested, just reach out to me at r-c-i-z-o-n at berrienhistory.org. Um, to donate anything like crowns, sashes, dresses, interview suits, memorabilia, videos, photos, signs, whatever you got that tells the story of the Blossom Time pageant we're looking for. We are also coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, our uh, very first trivia night here for the Berrien County Historical Association uh, will be on March 20th. And that is that my, this quarter's theme is crowns and sashes to get us in the mood for our upcoming pageant exhibit. And then on the 11th is our TNC talk, and that will be uh, Dora Whitney, later lawyer. She's one of the first women admitted to the Michigan Bar. And Carrie Charlotte of the Michigan Bar Association will be talking about it. So we're very excited about that. Information about these programs and signups for registration or to get the Zoom links, go to our website, varianhistory.org. So Dr. Sally Haddon comes to us from Western Michigan University. And we're very glad to have her. Um, when we put the call out for this, we didn't exactly know kind of where we were going to go with it. And after a wonderful conversation with um, Dr. Haddon, we decided to go forth with this conversation about what makes American law the way it is and how it differs from other legal systems around the world. Um, she received her doctorate in law degrees from Harvard University, so we know she's super smart, and she is a legal historian for Early America and the Antebellum U.S. Her book Slave Patrols, Law and Violence in Virginia and the Carolinas came out in 2001, but it's still a very relevant topic we're seeing today. It looked on the history of black, on, the white on black violence, the state created officers, which were first seen in the 17th century Caribbean and then transplanted to North America, where they endured until the end of the Civil War. She's co edited the Blackwell Companion for American Legal History and Signpost New Directions in Southern Legal History. She's a past officer and board member of the American Society of Legal History. Uh, Haddon serves on the editorial board of Law and History Review. So, obviously, Dr. Haddon's a very smart lady and will be, guide us quite well today. And of course, she is a member of the history faculty at Western Michigan. So I'm going to step away and I'm going to allow Dr. Haddon to tell us all about American legal history. It's all on you, Dr. Haddon. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Rhiannon. Um, sorry about uh, cutting out there accidentally. I realized I was signed in with a different person's uh, login. So uh, thanks for the kind introduction and I'm delighted to be able to speak to you uh, today and uh, to tell you more about where the common law comes from and also to talk about various legal systems from around the world. So you're here today because you are interested in knowing more about the common law and I'm going to explain where the common law comes from and what it is. I'm going to keep circling back to the common law as I explain various aspects of law worldwide. So you'll learn a little bit about different sources of the law. You'll learn a little bit about the Norman conquest and how common law developed. And you'll also learn a little bit about the main rival legal system to common law, namely the civil law tradition. And by the end, you ought to be able to understand each of them and to also understand what makes them different. So in explaining about common law, you're gonna learn about other legal systems and other legal sources to give you a contrast. So here we go. The first and simplest answer uh, about the common law is that the common law came from England. And 
uh, this was our due to our colonial connection to England. Um, England is the source of the legal tradition of common law that arrived in America, and our legal heritage owes a lot to England, and we're not alone. Every place that England colonized during its imperial period also uh, shares the common law system, and that includes Australia, South Africa, British Guiana, and various Caribbean islands, as well as Canada. Of course, in each of those areas, the common law has developed in slightly different ways. So Australian law isn't identical to American law, for example. And knowing that the common law comes from England because we were a colony only takes us back to um, about the American time of the American Revolution. So to understand the multiple legal systems that exist around the world and where common law fits into this bigger picture, we have to step back and look at the various sources of law that exist. And I'm gonna use America as an example, but this sources list, sources of law, could apply and does apply to many countries in the world, not just America. So for a few moments, I'll be explaining the various sources of law that exist worldwide. Now this law list isn't exhaustive, but it will cover the main sources of law that you ought to know. A major source of law in America and elsewhere is religion. Religion provides the basis of several major legal systems in the world, including Islamic law, uh, which is known as Sharia. Islamic law is applied in many countries as a part or as the total legal system um, for those countries. In some spots, it's only used for particular issues like relating to marriage or divorce. But in other countries like Saudi Arabia, Sharia constitutes the formal legal system for all matters. Now, other major religious legal systems include Hindu law observed in India, Talmudic law observed in Israel, and uh, there are of course other legal systems that are religiously based as well. And there are of course Muslims and Hindus and Jews who live in the United States, as well as observers of other faiths like Catholicism. As a result, there are individuals who live in America who observe Islamic law, Talmudic law, Hindu law, and Catholic law. Now Catholic law is usually referred to as canon law or ecclesiastical law. Now these legal traditions guide the observant and the faithful who will abide by their strictures when it comes to things like marriage and divorce and other matters like food or health or how to behave towards other individuals. Another major source of law in America and indeed worldwide is philosophy and ethics. Now these have been major sources, uh, sorry, major forces in society. And many people, while they're not necessarily religious, certainly follow ethical or moral systems that are derived from various important thinkers who have gone before us. Now in China, Confucianism is based on precepts that were developed in the sixth century BCE by Confucius, major Chinese philosopher. Now, while some people follow Confucianism for its religious guidance, others are guided by its philosophical elements. And indeed, Confucianism as a philosophy has followers and believers on every continent. The same could be said for the philosophical views of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Um, their ideas have been around for centuries as well. Among the more familiar concepts from Aristotelian philosophy are notions about logic, being, virtue, metaphysics, the soul, um, art, among many others. And of course, there have been um, many philosophers through the ages um, and their influence upon uh, Americans who follow their precepts ranges far and wide. From Socrates to Jacques Derrida, Philosophy and ethics continue to both be powerful forces for many people who seek legal remedies in our courts. And if you want an example of how Aristotelian philosophy influences us, um, then think about Aristotelian logic. Uh, we rely upon logic as a way to reach outcomes in our courts. For example, if only one person can be the murderer and A is the killer, then B can't be the killer also, for example. 
So we subscribe to not just views about Aristotelian logic, but we also have adopted a number of general views that come to us from enlightenment philosophy, such as equality before the law or the concept of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Some people think of these principles not as coming from a particular philosophical tradition like Aristotelian logic or the Enlightenment, but suggest that they should be referred to as guides from sources called natural law or higher law. But whether you call it uh, natural law or the Enlightenment, these principles are philosophical concepts that guide people in abstract thought. Okay, so in addition to religion and ethical or philosophical views, another source, another powerful source of law in America is customary practice, what we might call customary law. This is true not just for America, but customary law exists around the world. And indeed, customary law might be considered the most powerful legal system ever, uh, especially for people who don't have systems of writing. Now, this is true in a lot of places that where writing is not common or where writing is not largely available. People rely upon customary practices, customary law to guide their daily lives. This is true in, in many parts of uh, Africa, but also true in parts of South America, and indeed in parts of America as well. Custom isn't written down. Custom is something that can change, unlike rules or laws that have a written basis. Customary law exists in the absence of writing, generally speaking. We call written down law positive law. Written down law, positive law, is a rule typically created by a group that exists on paper. It's been positively expressed. That is created by a formal process and committed to words on paper by a group or a governing body. Positive law can be created by a sultan, a czar, a, a legislature, or a school group for that matter, but it represents an effort to put the rule onto paper. That's positive law. Positive law is very different from customary law. Customary practices are almost never written down, very rarely written down, while positive law exists in black and white. And that takes us to the next big general source of law in America, which is a type of positive law, namely legislation. Legislation is something that we're all fairly familiar with uh, from living in the United States. We're accustomed to thinking about the bills created by the Congress, which then go to the president for his signature. That's legislation. Um, you may remember the Saturday morning cartoon from Schoolhouse Rock entitled, I'm Just a Bill. Well, a bill might become a law if both houses of Congress agree, and then the president signs the bill into law. But of course, there are other sources of legislation, other legislatures that can create laws. For example, legislation at the state level. We've got 50 of them, in fact. And another thing that we put under the category of legislation is municipal or county level ordinances, uh, laws that might be passed by your city or county authority. These would all be examples of positive law whether it's created by Congress, a state legislature, or city government, these are all positive laws, the creation of a law, a piece of legislation by a formal process committed in words on paper by a governing body. Now, of course, in America, um, we don't just have uh, legislation. We also have laws that are created by courts. And uh, this is, um, true for us. We have laws uh, created by courts, but in other countries, the laws pronounced by court judges are not considered the supreme law of the land. In civil law countries, the highest form of law is law that is found in a code. Um, another name for countries that rely upon codes is the civil law system. They rely upon legislation as the highest form of law, and there are civil law countries around the globe. Uh, most of Europe um, is under some form of civil law, uh, as is true for Central and South America, parts of Africa, parts of Asia, Scotland, and Quebec also. In addition, Puerto Rico, Louisiana, Texas, and California all have civil law as part of their heritage. And in those places, civil law is mixed 
with the common law for different branches of government. Okay, so civil law is based upon legislation. It's based upon codes. So positive law in this particular instance, this type of civil law, is the highest form of law in these jurisdictions, in these areas of the globe that you see here in blue. The spread of civil law began in, in Rome. It spread through most of Europe and in areas that were colonized, uh, like when France colonized Southeast Asia or when Spain and Portugal colonized Central and South America and places, um, uh, countries like Angola and Africa, these colonized areas also adopted the civil law. This is how civil law spread to, through so much of the world, to Asia and parts of Africa, especially Central and South America, is because colonization helped the spread. Okay, so let's go back to sources of law. Another source of law in America, as well as in some other countries, is administrative law. This is the most recent source of law in our country. It really only dates back to the beginning of the 20th century with the rise of a lot of government agencies like the Department of the Interior under Teddy Roosevelt. Agencies create administrative rules that are binding upon citizen behavior like marking out areas in the national parks that are closed to the public or areas that are reserved for various wildlife projects. Agencies also have the ability to not just follow the rules that are set down for them by Congress. Congress may create legislation that agencies have to interpret, such as uh, when the um, Immigration and Naturalization Service um, chooses to deport individuals, or think of the people at the airport who check your bags, who work for TSA, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security. Agencies also create um, agency rules, and they issue those rules uh, in areas that are really too technical for legislation. A good example of this is the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, and its tax court. The tax court interprets the tax code um, on areas, for example, like how to interpret uh, when somebody receives tax um, from income, should pay tax on income from a second home. Last but not least, um, hardly least, in the United States, we also rely upon courts as a source of law. Court decisions also call rulings into dispute and give a specific outcome. We like court decisions, generally speaking, because they yield certainty and they give a, a specific resolution. We get reliability for the future. Sometimes, however, court decisions don't end the dispute. They require a new court, a new trial to be held. Perhaps what happens is they send a case back to a lower court for another hearing, or maybe a court decision releases a person from imprisonment. In those instances, the court's decision may not necessarily end a dispute, but may reset the clock. If the case is referred back to a lower court for a rehearing, then uh, maybe there'll be a, a second trial and circumstances of the dispute may be heard again. Now, courts follow the common law. Um, they follow the common law, uh, and what we mean by this is they are looking to earlier court decisions to guide their decisions. Um, they follow this guiding principle known as stare decisis, which you may know by another name. It is often called precedent. Now, precedent is a concept that a judge can look to earlier cases for guidance. Uh, a judge can look to earlier cases that are similar, attempting to find a similar type of conflict or a rule from that earlier case that may guide him in the present. So if um, the judge is deciding case C, the judge may look back to earlier cases like case B or case A to try to find a similar principle that might guide him. He can be guided by an earlier lawsuit's determination about how he should make his ruling in case C. So in other words, he looks to lawsuits of the past to find a principle like a standard or a rule that can assist him in reaching a conclusion. Now, the facts 
of those earlier cases don't have to be identical to his. The judge is usually looking for principles, standards, or rules from those earlier cases that he can apply in his present case so that he will treat a similar case a similar way. Similar situation gets a similar outcome. Of course, a judge may decide that the cases aren't alike, um, and he might choose to ignore some of those earlier principles to reach a decision in the present. In the present. And of course, there are lawyers, lawyers who prepare their cases trying to find different strings of precedents to offer to the judge, precedents that might point in different directions towards different outcomes, one that would favor client A and a different that would favor client B. So lawyers are very good at finding earlier precedents in different cases that might affect how a judge reaches a decision. You could see in this case that if the judge in case G is looking for um, uh, how to be guided, lawyers on competing sides might offer him two different sets of precedents for him to follow. Um, of course, the, the judge might decide that all cases aren't alike. He might choose to ignore some of those earlier principles to reach a decision in the precedent. This is a way that um, judges are able to let the law evolve in a common law setting um, a judge in America could either choose to be bound by precedent from an earlier line of cases, or he might let the law evolve and change with the times by following um, a set of rules from a different string of cases. Okay, so that gives you a sense of the major sources of law that um, exist in America, and not just in America, these are uh, present in many countries, not just American, uh, in America particularly. And so now that you understand a little bit more about where, what precedents are and where they come from, let's take a look at where common law comes from. So we're gonna go back to this notion of common law and try to discover where it comes from. As I said at the beginning, we get common law from England, but that only as, answers the question of where do we get common law from. We need to know a little bit more about where the English got common law from. In England, common law began to develop around the 12th century in the time of Henry II, King Henry II. And we think of him as the person who resolved many of the disputes that came about as a result of the Norman conquest in 1066. That was 100 years before Henry's time, but by Henry's time, um, the, when the Normans arrived in, from France in 1066, they found in England that there were multiple systems of justice, multiple legal systems already in use. There were three big ones. There were laws from Wessex, laws from Mercia, and what we know as the Dane law. And so when the Normans arrived in 1066, England did not have a unified set of laws. And even beyond those three sets of uh, laws, there were even more differences and variations. There are 32 counties and there were variations in all of those 32 counties. So litigation was uncertain when the Normans arrived in 1066. And um, then the conquest complicated things even more. Um, there were a lot of claims and counterclaims about who should own the land. Uh, somebody from Wessex or was it somebody from um, uh, the Norman kingdom from France? People kept coming to Henry II asking for justice. Does the land belong to X or does the land belong to Y? And so they kept coming to the king as a source of justice. And this is actually something that they shared with the past. People who lived in kingdoms often went to the kings expecting to get justice or at least some kind of resolution to their problems. Henry's solution to the confusion created by the Norman conquest was to create a series of courts and court rules that made it easier to figure out how to receive justice. And what we see here are images of Henry II um, in life delivering justice. He's the guy um, who you can see in the left, but also you can see him here, uh, an image of him from um, uh, his sarcophagus. So uh, the Henry solution was to create a series of courts and court rules that made it easier to figure out how to receive justice. But the common law did something very specific. It got rid of all that local variation, 
all of those 32 different county variations that existed at the lowest level, even the variation that existed between Dane law and the laws of Wessex or Mercia. Henry effectively created a legal system that was uniform, that was, this, the law was supposed to be the same whether you were in London or in Liverpool. Henry II was responsible for creating a uniform system of courts as well as court rules that relied upon um, royal justice to give people access to reliable justice. Now, of course, Henry didn't want to just end the disorder and confusion that existed after the Norman conquest. He also had a financial incentive. Henry uh, knew that providing law and order was profitable because people had to pay to use the courts. And sometimes the courts issued rulings that meant that the land didn't go to A or B, but the land went to the king instead. The people are said by chroniclers of this time to have groaned under the burden of royal investigations and money raising judicial expeditions. And yet apparently they still flocked to the royal courts because they paid the judges because they wanted justice. They wanted certainty and reliability. The main attraction was that certainty. A royal decision could end a dispute for all time. So royal justice gradually gained ground over all of the older institutions because it both provided certainty, but also because it suited the king. The king wanted money. And it expanded so much because of something else that Henry II did. Henry used members of his own royal entourage, his group of associates, to keep peace and dole out justice across the country. He sent out a person known as a justichar, a deputy of the king, to the far reaches of England to provide justice, to deliver justice no matter how far away people lived. Sometimes he, sometimes he sent these justices out in groups and groups of traveling justices would transact business, legal business, wherever it was required. And eventually these trips became routine. They became routinized, um, delivering the king's justice, but they also delivered the king's administration in those local areas. Um, that included things like tax collection. They brought government, both justice as well as taxes, to every village. And so the locals feared them, but also respected them. Now, in addition, people could come to Henry himself to get justice, find the king, present your complaint, get a hearing, get a result. Now this sounds easy, but it wasn't all the time. There was no fixed residence for the king in this time period. Um, staying in the same place wasn't sound policy um, because it's risky. Uh, a king can get assassinated if he stays in the same place too long. Um, it's risky militarily. If all of his uh, generals and uh, military followers are with him, well, then you might get an invasion from someplace like Scotland if he's too far away. So it was also hard to support a king's court, all the people around him, his big entourage, in terms of food and supplies. It just put a strain on the local system. So what this means is that Henry and his court and the kings who followed Henry moved around from time to time. And what that meant was that if a person wanted to go to the king and get justice, they had to find him. They had to figure out where he was. And eventually the king became accustomed to leaving a group of administrators in London. And people became accustomed to going to London to ask that group of administrators to resolve their problems. Eventually a stationary, non-moving royal court developed, one that was away from the king's presence. We think that it happened before 1190, but we're not entirely sure exactly when it started. But it is clear that Henry II began to order five people from his household to stay in London and deliver justice to the people who came looking for the king when the king was someplace else. King John in Magna Carta in 1215 guaranteed that a court could always be found in London for those who wanted it. And this is the origins of the earliest royal courts of justice, of which there were, and still are, three. By 1234, we know all of their names, 
as they continue to be known today. There's the Court of King's Bench, which is called the Court of Queen's Bench, when we have a queen like Elizabeth, who is the ruler. Uh, King's Bench was the court that originally went around with the king, wherever he was or she was, um, but it eventually, it too also settled in London. That's the first one, the Court of King's Bench. Then there's the second, the Court of Common Pleas. That was the group of administrators who always stayed in London. And third of all, there was the Exchequer, also known as the Court of Chancery. And Chancery is where we go next. What was Chancery? Well, the rules that Henry II developed in his courts were great for providing uniform, predictable justice most of the time. However, sometimes the outcome of the case might be knowable, but it might not seem just or fair. Chancery um, was a place where people could go to seek fair outcomes. Um, it also has a second name that it goes by. It's also known as equity, the court of equity. Equity developed as a way to provide a remedy for some of the shortcomings of common law courts in England, the Court of King's Bench and the Court of Common Pleas. Equity was a way to give people who deserve justice a way to get it if the common law rules prohibited them from getting it in the regular way. And you might say, well, how could the courts be unfair? Well, here's an example. Suppose that a person uh, was, um, their land was part of a dispute. There are two people who both had a claim on this plot of land. And one person goes to court and says, the land is mine. And the other person doesn't show up. And after a time, the court says, well, we'll give it to you. You came, you showed up, the land belongs to you. Well, then let's say the next year, the other person shows up and they say, well, I couldn't come and give you justice because I was away on a crusade or I was in jail. I was in prison in another country. The land rightfully belongs to me but I was locked up someplace else or I was on crusade. I didn't have the opportunity to have my time in court for my rights to be heard and listened to. And a court of equity, the court of chancery by another name would say, you're right. You deserve another chance for your claim to be heard. And so that's a way that um, equity could provide a, a fairer or perhaps more just outcome than common law courts could do. Okay, so you've got common law. When we talk about common law, we typically mean that it refers to, it's common in three different ways. It is a national system of uniform justice. It's for all of England, as opposed to a particular place. It's the common law for all of England, as opposed to the law for Wessex or the law for Mercy or the law for Wales. It's common for all. Um, a second way that we mean common law is when we say common law as opposed to civil law, those code-based systems like the ones that we see in France or other parts of, of Europe. Um, common law was not code-based. Common law was largely derived from English laws, from English customs, from English court decisions. So it's English as opposed to European. Third and last of all, Common law is not the same as equity. Um, it's um, Common law is a set of practices that grew up in the common law courts, not the equity courts. And so we often refer to common law in distinction to equity. Um, equity, which generally speaking, started around the 14th century to remedy some of the failings or shortcomings of those common law courts, uh, where the common law courts might have a result that was seemed unfair. So equity is different from common law. Now, in America, we got England's common law when the first English settlers arrived. They brought their knowledge of England's court and legal system with them. But we have to be careful to remember <clears throat> that the colonists uh, didn't bring all parts of England's law with them. They didn't bring every single bit. There were some parts that they deliberately excluded. And then the colonists went and they created their own laws. Um, and you can easily imagine the kinds of laws that the colonists needed to create. For example, if they were going to have slavery, the institution of slavery would require laws that England did not have. And the colonies did do that. The colonies that adopted slavery and slavery was legal in all colonies in North America before the American Revolution, then those colonies had to create those laws that would cover all the situations about slaves. Bear in mind that when the American Revolution happened, 
which was already the, the common law in, in America was already slightly different from England. There were already differences between English common law and American common law. But it's at the revolution, they're about to get even farther apart because the states and the national government in the United States would each make their own individual decisions about which parts of English common law they would choose to adopt or reject. And in addition to inheriting England's common law, we also inherited England's equity law, that practice of offering fairness when sometimes justice doesn't work out too well. In the colonial period, the colonies sometimes had two parallel courts, law courts and equity courts, just like in England. But after the revolution, almost all states unified their courts, combining and merging the courts of law and the courts of equity together so that law and equity could be dispensed by the same judge. So when a lawyer today enters a pleading before an American judge, the lawyer can make arguments based on both law and equity. Now, these distinctions, of course, leave out the law that was known to Native Americans who were following their customs, people who came from other co countries, not England, when they got to America. And of course, the common law doesn't apply to all bits of America. Some states that were settled by people who came from parts of France or Spain, um, they inherited the civil law tradition. So for example, while everything in, in this map is, is civil law is blue, remember that say for example, Louisiana and Quebec, which were settled by French settlers, brought with them parts of the civil law. So um, there are parts of America that still have civil law tradition built into their legal system. Like for example, California, uh, Louisiana, Texas, and California all have elements of the civil law. Um, you may have heard of divorce cases in civil law and why people don't necessarily wanna get divorced in California. And the reason is because under the civil law tradition, all of the assets that have been gained during the marriage, regardless of who earned them, are divided evenly in a civil law uh, jurisdiction like California. If you were in a common law state, um, a state like Virginia, then that rule wouldn't apply. Um, so the California rule can be traced back to the civil law codes of Europe. All right, so the main contrasting system to common law that most people know about is the civil law system. Civil law began in ancient Rome and it's older than common law and it had a very different trajectory of development. And as I mentioned, and as this map makes clear, civil law is still used in most of Europe, parts of Africa, Asia, and nearly all of Central and South America. It covers more of the globe than the common law does. Um, the civil law began in Rome, but eventually it was influenced by Germanic customary law and also the ecclesiastical law of the church. And that's what I wanna talk about next. The civil law tradition, the great worldwide competitor to the common law. Civil law started in Rome and it lasted through two great phases. The first lasted more than a thousand years from the formation of Rome as a city-state all the way up to the sixth century AD to the Emperor Justinian. And this is an image of the Emperor Justinian from the sixth century. And during that long thousand year period, Roman law developed out of cases Primarily, it also developed out of legislation, but mostly out of case law. And eventually, under Justinian in the sixth century, the laws from both court decisions as well as legislation were compiled and codified. They were put together into a single document and organized according to subject matter. All the cases about animals, all the cases about people, all the cases about criminals. And the great compilation was known as the Corpus Juris Civilis. Corpus Juris Civilis, and that image on the right is a, sorry, a fairly bad image of the Corpus Juris Civilis. And the second phase of Roman legal history happened when medieval scholars rediscovered Roman law as an academic subject, and that happened around the 11th century. Academics found materials about the Corpus Juris Civilis in the 11th century. It was 500 years old at that time, but they began studying it. They began teaching others about it. And by the 15th century, Roman law was no longer just an academic subject, but it was a living, breathing, 
influential body of work that had gradually become entwined with local customary practices. And it was German customary practices that had the biggest influence back upon the Roman law that had been inherited. And this was also a time when the Catholic Church's ecclesiastical law or canon law became enmeshed in parts of the civil law. Another uh, word that we might use to describe this kind of three-way mix of Roman law, canon law, and customary law was the jus commune, uh, a universal law to be used across all of Europe and known by all. However, in the 18th century, well, really actually in the 17th, but primarily in the 18th century, Nations began to develop. Uh, countries became much more aware of themselves as nations, and nationalism became a real force. And countries began to want their own distinct codes. They wanted their own laws specific to them. And this is when the civil law began to splinter into many different civil law traditions as separate countries enacted their own versions of the codified law. And the demand for separate nation-based law codes began with Denmark and Sweden that developed the first national codes in 1683 and 1734. And it continued in Bavaria and in Prussia and in Austria. Those, code, those countries developed their own national law codes in the 18th and 19th centuries. But the most important codification event was the creation in France by Napoleon of the French Civil Code, also known as the Code Napoleon. At the time of the French Revolution, which happens a little bit before Napoleon, when the French Revolution was taking place in France in the 1780s and 1790s in France, there were two different dominant legal traditions. There was a very strong body of customary law in the north, and then there was the written law in the south that was based upon Roman law. Uh, the revolutionaries, uh, people like Robespierre, were extremely suspicious of um, the past, they were generally hostile to both the customary law of the North, the Roman law of the South, and eventually the revolutionaries wanted to get rid of all of it. Um, they wanted to eliminate the feudal land system that um, enriched the aristocracy. They wanted to get rid of control by the church, which they thought was embedded into ecclesiastical law. And so they did, they wrote new laws that got rid of the feudal land system, um, they made uh, marriage a secular act, not a religious act. Um, they got rid of distinctions between uh, different classes of people. And after the French Revolution was over, under Napoleon, in the beginning of the 19th century, Napoleon had four lawyers and judges sit down, and those four put together a fusion of the customary law from the North, the Roman law from the South, and the laws that some, the most popular of the laws that the revolutionaries from the French Revolution had developed. And this was in line, this attempt to create an all-encompassing source of law was very much in line with the power of the Enlightenment, a dominant movement at this time that prevailed, that people believed in. They thought that the entirety of the world could be explained and put into a system. And we still live with elements of the Enlightenment even today. Uh, two big uh, developments out of the Enlightenment were things like encyclopedias and uh, dictionaries. You want to sort and put into order uh, particular kinds of knowledge. And so the Napoleonic Code, as it was developed in the early 19th century, um, had some big similarities to the Justinian's Corpus Juris Civilis. It divided the legal universe into three different categories, um, into persons and property and ways that you get property. But each book of the code was divided into titles and the titles were subdivided into chapters and so on. So book one of the Code Napoleon that's about people was divided into titles and then subtitles, each subsection, things like marriage or divorce or guardianship and so on with solutions for many, but not every situation. The drafters of the code recognized that a judge could not foresee every possible situation, every possible application of a basic legal principle. And so they didn't get particular. Instead, they tried to write rules that were very general. And this codified system, the Code Napoleon, relies upon general, generally stated rules. They're not specific so much as general. And this is one reason why the Napoleonic Code 
continues to evolve and to change and to be a, continues to be a very powerful source of law around the world. Um, if you were to go to law school in Louisiana, um, you would have to study the, the code as it's known there. The importance of the code wasn't just that it fostered unity, legal unity in France, but that it was also adopted or imitated in so many countries around the world. And in part, it was adopted or imitated because of its clarity and the simplicity of its rules. So um, I'm hopeful that uh, in this you know, 40 minute presentation, that this has helped you better understand the common law, different sources of law, and different systems of law that are present in countries around the globe and how the common law came to be and what precedent is. Um, thanks for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions at this time. Awesome, well, thank you so much. No wonder it takes you three years ago to go through law school. That's a lot in 40 minutes. <laughs> and I'm sure it is indeed. It's only a portion of it. Um, Peter, you're our only guest. Did you have any questions for the good doctor today on anything that she had said, or are you kind of doing okay? I will say, well, if he has a question, feel free to write in the chat or unmute yourself. I do want to say, I think that our legal system is probably one of the best examples of this melting pot theory that we've always talked about in history in terms yeah. of America. And I feel like if you want to look at anywhere where all these things come together, it's right there in the legal system because there's like 85 different influences coming in. And we're still seeing that shifted as power is shifting at that top level where the I'm just a bill is occurring with people who are in power and they're from minority groups or underrepresented organizations or segments of society and that are changing it which is why we wanted to talk about law and right. social justice movements because it is such a malleable kind of thing. We're seeing it now. There are, you know, even in the, even against the Supreme Court, there are things going against, going up against the Supreme Court right now that, you know, maybe they, a similar case they rejected, but they're willing to read this case and things like that. Um, okay, so Peter's got a question over yeah. in chat. Um, both the second phase of Roman law and English common law had origins in the 11th century. Is that coincidental or are they responding to something else going on in Europe? Um, okay, so um, Peter, that's a really, you've spotted, a, you've spotted something that other scholars have talked about and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I would have to say that while there are certain uh, uh, tendencies to try to create um, knowable, reliable justice, probably the greatest thing that drove both the second phase of Roman uh, legal development, civil law tradition, and English common law has to do with violence. Um, and this is uh, something that would have been common in both uh, continental Europe as well as in England in this time period. The, the predominant form of the way that a lot of justice was delivered in England before Henry II, before the Norman Conquest, they're still doing trial by uh, trial by combat. They're still doing uh, trial by ordeal. Um, so for example, it, it, trial by combat is you, you basically fight it out, two guys with swords and whoever wins, well, their side must be the right one. Trial by ordeal, um, cases where let's say a, a judge might say, we wanna find out who the criminal is, we will take the person who we suspect knows something about this and we will put them between two incredibly heavy rocks and crush them. And so they will, if they survive the ordeal, then uh, perhaps, you know, things are fine. And they, they were ordained by God, they're blessed by God and therefore they're right, they're, their cause is just. Um, the same thing is happening in Central Europe and in continental Europe rather, um, that there's a lot of violence in the you know ninth tenth eleventh centuries where people are still riding around this is the the heyday of knights on horseback and local rulers who sometimes delivered justice at the tip of a sword um the the justice that we think of as kind of impartial or fair in this time period did not always get delivered and so probably the thing that is driving this second phase of of, of the roman tradition 
and the Roman legal tradition and English common law may be rooted. Um, it probably has other common roots, but that's certainly something that is a connection is the, the violence that was endemic in those societies. Fantastic. I think some people today would far prefer to go back to trial by combat than deal with the legal system. <laughs> oh, you, you don't want trial by combat, trust me. <laughs> uh, trial, trial by combat is uh, basically another expression of the phrase might makes right. Yep. Um, and uh, might makes right is not where you want to go. That just means that the biggest bully often wins. Often and wins. So, yeah, that doesn't necessarily mean you get fairness and justice, but that may certainly there are people who might prefer that but um uh people like you and me that's not that's probably not where we want to end up no kind of reminds me a little bit of the um how that survived i mean well into the 20th century people still doing duels like i will duel you and this you know then i'll get the justice that i deserve <laughs> you know the the dueling tradition really goes back to um people sense that they can only get justice if they find it themselves. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I didn't talk about as a source of law for many people is this notion of what we what we refer to in the legal trade as self-help. And self-help is I've got a gun in my hand and I help myself. Right. Um, and and that really is the, um, the, the most pointed example of might makes right. I've got the bigger sword, I've got the bigger gun, and who cares about justice? It's it's a it's a spaghetti Western waiting to happen, right? And that that's not the kind of justice we like, but sometimes, you know, self-help as a tradition exists in America, people still resort to it because they think that they're not getting justice from wherever the, the system is providing it. For people who lived in the West, sometimes it was that there, there wasn't a court for a hundred miles. Right. And so if they wanted justice, they had to take it into their own hands. That sort of rationale, really doesn't apply today. Um, you know, there's a county for, you know, everybody who lives in America, there's a county courthouse that's readily available. Um, but there's still some people who believe in the self-help tradition. And that's another source of law. I just, I talk about that. Yeah, but it is, it is something that we do see. And it is something that does still make the news, you know, you know, Absolutely. rapist or a child molester shot by their victim or their victim's parents because there was not enough evidence to convict them in the court of law. Um, one can make the argument that even some people who take their own lives, such as we saw with Jeffrey Epstein or the, the gymnastics doctor um, who would rather, Dr. you know, yes, thank you. I could not remember his name, you know, taking their lives so that they don't have to face the consequences of, you know, what the legal repercussions of their behavior is. So. Yeah, it's gonna be very interesting now that we kind of know this very unique system, our system of ours, that how it's been utilized by corporations or individuals or nonprofits or governments to kind of shape uh, the social justice movements that we'll be talking about a little bit later. Our next one will be in May, and Dr. Haddon's colleague from Western Michigan will be speaking about environmental justice and how the average person uses the law to shape a much healthier environment. While we wish we could do that in April, the next one is technically going to be a religious history. Still looking for our guest speaker on that. So if there's no more questions, um, Dr. Haddon, I want to say thank you so much for joining us today. It is a Sunday. It is a day off for you, um, but you've chosen to take the time to come out and you'll spend a little bit of time with us talking about this and giving us a good foundation for the rest of this lecture series. So on behalf of the BCHA, I want to thank you for coming out and giving this lecture. And to our guests, thank you for watching. We're very glad to have you. This video, like many others, will be available on our YouTube page shortly. Um, and we will additionally add links to it on a new page on our website called Media. So keep an eye on that so you can catch this later. Uh, if you have any further questions about the BCHA, about our series or anything else, uh, please email us at info at bearinghistory.org. <laughs> Otherwise, have a great rest of the weekend. Thank you. Very much, Ryan.